This is a letter dated St. Cuthbert's Day, the 4th of September, the year of our Lord, 1680, from the Reverend George Hardacre, Vicar of St. Michael's at Kirkham in the county of Lancashire, to Sir James Clifton of Lytham Hall in the same aforesaid county. My dear Sir James, I must beg your forgiveness, firstly for my unseemly haste in departing your wife's birthday party on the 27th ult, and secondly for my tardiness in offering an explanation for my behaviour. It has taken me until now to be clear about the events, through many hours of prayer and quiet contemplation. As near as I can be sure, what happened was this. I was in the banqueting hall with the rest of your guests. The clock had just struck eight, and your servants were moving the tables to clear the middle of the hall for dancing before the play. I must congratulate you on the excellent meal you served. Your cook really outdid himself. I, being a confirmed bachelor these many years, and more than a little lame, chose to sit on the edge of the throng and observe. Some minutes into the second dance, William Granger, the miller from over wire, came to sit facing me. He is a tiresome fellow, grown fat on the backs of his customers. I trust you will not repeat that to him. But I was initially glad of his company, as everyone else I knew had gone to dance. He wanted to show off a device that he said he had got from France, though I suspect it was from Birmingham or some such place, a clock that fit in the palm of his hand. What wonders this age brings forth! He said he had paid ten guineas for it, which I found almost harder to countenance than the fact of its existence. He wore a new garment that had been made especially for carrying this tiny clock, a sleeveless coat with pockets on the waist. Apparently the king has been seen wearing this fashion, so I have no doubt that next season every gentleman will be sporting these waistcoats. With the music and the chatter of people nearby, I found it hard to follow what Granger was saying, and my attention wandered. I caught sight of the conjurers you had hired to entertain us during the meal, coming towards us. As you know, I do not approve of their art, since it can lead the innocent into more diabolical pursuits. They mistook my gaze for interest and came over to me. I told them I did not want to see any tricks, but Granger said he would. The man produced a pack of playing cards, another instrument of vice, and proceeded to perform some clumsy sleight of hand with them, while the woman kept up some glib patter, doubtless to distract Granger from the man's lack of skill. While this was going on, I saw a dog's tail emerge from the gap between the woman's dress and Granger's ample stomach. Granger's clock was peeking out of the top of the pocket into which he had thrust it. I had been thinking about the transfiguration scene in the evening's play. I saw it in Lancaster shortly after the theatres reopened, as well as the renewed rumours of witches in the east of the county. The noise and the heat of the hall had dulled my senses, and if I am scrupulously honest, I had sampled too widely from your wine cellar. In short, I believed the conjuring woman to be a witch who had a familiar in the shape of a dog, and I thought the familiar was going to steal Granger's clock for her. A terrible fear crept over me. If this witch was brazen enough to practice her foul arts within arm's reach of a man of the cloth, she must be powerful indeed. I had to stop her, before Granger was at risk of losing something far more valuable than his clock. If she saw me reaching for my crucifix, she might well turn on me. I happened to have a cup of water in my hand. The Dean of St. Jude's recommends it as a way of balancing the humours after drinking wine or ale. I lifted the cup to my lips and whispered the paternoster into the water while pretending to drink. Then, as hard as I could, I threw the water into the woman's face. When she had stopped screaming, I realised my mistake. The dog's tail belonged to one of your own dogs, which had been licking up some spilt gravy behind the woman. It was most unfortunate that when Granger jumped with surprise, his clock was ejected from his pocket and fell to the floor. I have written separately to him, but if you should see him before Holy Cross, the 14th of September, would you tell him that I will pay for the clock to be repaired, if he so desires? In conclusion, I offer my most sincere apologies for disrupting what had, until then, been a truly pleasant evening, and I hope I did not too greatly spoil your guests' enjoyment of Mr. Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. 
yours, etc. George Hardacre.